Good afternoon. I am Judy Woodward, the history coordinator of the Ramsey County Library. Normally, I would be welcoming you to this uh, Tuesday Scholar event. However, today is the first anniversary of the death of George Floyd. In accordance with Governor Tim Walz's proclamation for today, we will now observe nine minutes and 29 seconds of silence in memory of George Floyd and as the proclamation says, every person whose life has been cut short due to systems of racism and discrimination in Minnesota. We will re-begin uh, this program at uh, just around 1.10. Thank you. Thank you very much everyone for uh, observing that uh, period of silence uh, in response to the proclamation today of Governor Tim Walz. Uh, I am Judy Woodward, the history coordinator of the Ramsey County Library, and it is now my great pleasure today's program. Um, we will, uh, we are very happy to welcome today uh, Professor David Schultz, who will talk on the topic, Trump to Biden, a political transition. David Schultz is distinguished university professor of political science and legal studies at Hamlin University and also a professor of law at the University of Minnesota. He has been a frequent guest of this series and he's always welcome when he returns. Um, today's program is brought to you through the co-sponsorship of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute of the University of Minnesota with the financial support of the Friends of the Ramsey County Library. We are deeply grateful to both these organizations. And now I'd like to turn things over to our speaker, David Schultz, on the on Trump to Biden, a political transition. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much for all of you for attending today. I think it was just a few months ago I spoke to you. And the title today is somewhat amorphous or vague. Uh, Trump to Biden, a political transition. Because what I want to do today is, is set up a scenario where we try to look at, and just after the first few months, what, four months or so of Biden being in as president, um, how do we assess some of the differences between uh, how Donald Trump operated and performed as president of the United States versus how Biden is performing? And a lot of this is going to be about stylistics. I'm not giving a grade, even though I am a professor, um, but to try to lay out some kind of a contrast here in terms of understanding something about, about how they differ um, in terms of style um, issues they're addressing and a whole bunch of other things, as well as understanding their context. And in terms of starting off with my discussion here, I have to tell sort of two stories here. One of them and I think Judy will probably keep track of this as I'm speaking today, is that I tell a story that a few years ago in one of my classes that I was teaching, um, I kept recommending to students um, different books they might want to read if they're interested in the topic or more are interested in reading more about a topic. And at some point, one of the students raised his hand and was very flustered and said, why do you keep recommending all these books for us to read? Um, and I turned to him and said, because that's my job as a professor. Um, my job is, is to is sort of get you interested in a topic. And if you want to learn more, read. So I'm going to recommend a few different books today for those of you who are interested in further reading, since this is being done through a library program, we'll do that. The second story I want to tell, um, which really sets us up, I think, well for, for understanding something about uh, Biden versus Trump and, and what I want to talk about here today, takes us back to 2008. And in 2008, I was, I was privileged to have the U.S. State Department send me to Europe for several weeks uh, to speak about the 2008 elections. Remember, presidential elections featuring John McCain and at that time, Barack Obama. And I think it was in Helsinki or someplace, and I can't remember where I was speaking at one point. So for all of you who are Finnish, you should be happy. I've made it to, I made it to Finland at one point. Um, they asked, someone asked me a question about the, um, um, how, how at that point it looked pretty likely like Barack Obama was going to win. And someone said, well, how do you think Barack Obama's foreign policy is going to be different than that of George Bush's? And I thought that was a really good question. And I paused for a minute and I said, the best predictor of the next president's foreign policy is to look at his predecessor. 
And I, what I meant by that is that a new president takes office um, within the context, the legacy in the world that his predecessor left him and can't really start from scratch and, and operates from there. And so I use that as a story to say that in terms of also thinking about our title, Trump to Biden, a political transition, for good or for bad, and I'm not going to enter into this debate here, um, um, Donald Trump um, left the presidency and left a, a world to Joe Biden, out of which Joe Biden has to operate as president of the United States. And as he gets further and further into office, presumably he gets to mold the office, gets to mold American politics, perhaps in his own image, um, and, and, and sort of re redefine it. So part of what we should be thinking about today, if my big picture thesis is correct, is that in the same way that Donald Trump inherited a political world from Barack Obama, out of which he tried to operate and make changes, plus was also caught by the circumstances and continuities from, from Obama, same thing with Biden. He's operating from a world, a presidency that he inherited from Donald Trump, thus the notion of political transition and also transition in the sense of how Biden is trying to change things, right? So that's sort of the title here and what we're trying to come up with here. Now think about um, a, a variety of just off the top basic differences, of course we know, between Donald Trump and Joe Biden uh, in terms of thinking about their presidencies. And I'm gonna get to titles, by the way, very quickly and talk about those books. Um, think about it for the fact that Donald Trump came to the office of the presidency with no government and foreign policy experience um, whatsoever. Now, that is either good or it's bad, depending on your perspective. He ran as an outsider. He ran as somebody who said that, that we needed to bring an outsider set of experiences to Washington to be able to change things. He argued that the American political system was broke. We might recall that at his um, his speech accepting the nomination from the Republican Party, he said that um, the system was broken, that only he could fix it. So on the one hand, uh, Donald Trump comes to office as a consummate outsider. On the other hand, Joe Biden probably comes to the presidency uh, with some of the best credentials, at least formally, one has ever seen um, among somebody elected to the presidency. What was it, 37 years as a US Senator, um, eight years um, as a vice president. Um, those are pretty imp um, impressive inside Washington credentials. He ran not as the outsider, he ran as the person who with the experience could get things done um, and changed change the context um, of, of how America uh, was being governed. Additionally, uh, Trump came to office in 2009 um, during a period of sustained economic recovery. Uh, we had experienced many, many months, actually several years in a row of economic growth. And of course, there was no pandemic. And Biden comes to office, of course, uh, facing a pandemic and a pandemic-induced recession. Um, both presidents came to office um, facing, um, or came to office, rather not say facing, but came to office with unified governments, but divided populations. And what I mean by unified governments, both Biden and Trump um, um, were elected with what? With both the House and the Senate um, um, in the same party hands. Now, granted, Biden's margins are or more narrow than Trump had when he heard it, but still, that's important to think about here, that there is a window that both of them had. And if we also think about it, even though they had unified governments for both, both of them, they faced very, very divided countries, um, partisanly, politically, and so forth. And I've talked about that in many of my other engagements, and I might have even talked about this when I was um, here to talk to you folks several months ago. And so we also should be thinking about, finally, their personality differences um, in terms of uh, the types of persons they are um, and how they approach the world. And we've seen that already, of course, in the sense of, of, of the different tones in office, and we'll talk about that as we go. I mention all this by way of sort of introductory comments, um, simply to say that, that there are some parallels uh, between um, how the two of them inherited their office, um, and but at the same time, some very vast differences in terms of thinking about them. When I talk to my undergraduate students about 
about the presidency in American politics. One of the things that I talk about is how there's something really quite interesting that we've had, what, 46 presidents. And if we were to talk to historians, we would know that historians and maybe people who have thought something about the presidency would say, what, there are some presidents who we would consider to be great and considered some to be considered not so great. On the top of most lists, people would list people like George Washington, um, Abraham Lincoln, maybe Teddy Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, um, maybe Ronald Reagan um, as the list of great presidents in American history. Um, at the bottom of the list would be people like, let us say, what, James Buchanan, um, Andrew Johnson, what, maybe Herbert Hoover. And the reason why I say this to my students is that I point out that over time, since 1787, with the writing of the Constitution, all presidents have inherited the same constitutional powers um, as every, every previous president. We've never really changed the Constitution, Article 2, which is the power of the presidencies. We've never really changed the formal powers of the presidency from George Washington all the way up to Joe Biden. But yet some presidents are more successful than others in office. Some are able to accomplish more. Um, some, except for historians, rate them as more successful than others. Why? That's where I want us to start to think about it here. And here are four books that I want us to be thinking about um, in terms of the presidency that I think are just absolutely, um, and, and I don't know which the order is, um, but these are probably the four of the best books ever written on the American presidency. And for those of you who want to sort of, you know, be more scholarly, read more about it, they're very good. Arguably the single best book um, ever written on, on, American, or on the American presidency is Richard Neustadt's book, Presidential Power. Richard Neustadt um, takes his opening uh, or his inspiration from his book from a story involving uh, the 1952-1953 as Harry Truman is exiting from office and Dwight Eisenhower um, is taking over the presidency. And a reporter asked Harry Truman, can you give um, General Eisenhower, soon to become President Eisenhower, some good advice in terms of um, the presidency. And Harry Truman thought very pensively and eventually responded and said, poor Ike. He'll, he'll order people to do this, order people to do that, and he'll realize nobody listens. It's not like the army. And what Truman was getting at is that presidents just don't have the authority just to order people around. They can't bark out orders like a general or a five-star general head of the NATO command. And instead, what Richard Neustadt took from, from that quote was the idea that what presidents really can't order people around. The real power of the presidency mm -hmm. resides in what? The power to persuade. Um, it's about the ability to convince others to do what you want them to do. And what Neustadt's book is so good about is, is about talking about the factors that influence presidential persuasive power. And again, I certainly can't go through the entire list today, but he talks about, let us say, objective factors, for example, by how big of a margin this person won in terms of the election. Um, what is his approval rating? Um, does he have majorities of his own party in Congress? Um, but then he looks at other things in terms of what? How good of a speaker the president is? Um, what capacity does the president have to be able to um, work with the media? Uh, a whole bunch of other factors he looks at here. And the point being is that to really assess how good presidents are, the capacity of them to succeed, to to be able to mold the world and be efficacious as president, you have to understand the factors that influence the capacity of presidents to, presidents to be able to persuade others. And this is important, this ability to persuade, the ability to understand, again, um, how, how to convince other people to do what you want. The book is wonderful, Presidential Power, for looking at all these dynamics. And the point being is that even though all presidents 
nominally occupy the presidency with the same powers. Some are better able at using them than others. The second book, James McGregor Burns' book called Leadership. Now, some of you probably um, have heard all about leadership studies, and there's lots of people who go to leadership training and so forth. Uh, but James McGregor Burns' book, Leadership, is the granddaddy of all those books. And one of the things that he does in that book um, is to talk about um, two different types of leadership, transactional leaders versus transformational leaders. Transactional leaders are the quid pro quos. Um, they're negotiators. They, they are the ability to be able to, uh, to strike bargains. But the transformational leaders are the ones who change um, the direction of American politics. They get the public, they get others to look at the world differently. Those transformational presidents are people like an Abraham Lincoln, a Teddy Roosevelt, perhaps a, an FDR, and I would argue even Ronald Reagan all fit into that mold here. Um, um, so we've got this, this picture of some presidents having the capacity to really use the presidency to really change the direction of American politics. My third book, which I actually think is my favorite of all of them, is James David Barber's Presidential Character. And what James David Barber did back in the 1970s was to be one of the first of the people to sort of apply sort of psychoanalysis um, and psychology to understanding presidents. And he said that we could understand presidents or predict presidential behavior um, by looking at their, their formative years when they were adolescents. And so James David Barber in Presidential Character does this wonderful biography um, of many of the presidents, classifies them um, by, by, their, by their adolescent experiences with politics, by their, their, their sense of style and so forth. And again, the point being, he argues, that presidents bring their personalities to office. It is that personality that molds, that defines, that sets up how, how um, they're going to operate. And then the last book, and I'll spell out the author's name for you, it's Stephen Skoronik. His last name is spelled S-K-O-W, S-K-O-W-R-O-N-E-K, Stephen Skoronik, and he spells it S-T-E-P-H-E-N. And it's called Presidential Leadership in Political Time, Presidential Leadership in Political Time, Reprisal and Reappraisal. And what Stephen Skoronik argues is that we have to look at presidents in terms of time and history. What were the objective historical circumstances um, in which they occupied the office? Did they come to office during a crisis, during a war, during um, economically good times? The point being for Skoronik, Presidential, presidents don't have the authority simply to uh, reset the clock, turn the clock back in time, um, to, to sort of ignore the world where it is, but instead take office in terms of time and context of where they operate. That's in some sense that quote that I gave you that I used in Finland um, sort of harkens a little bit to that. Why are these four books important? And by the way, there may be a couple of others, but these are my four favorite books um, that if I ever taught just a class on the presidency, these would be the four that I would use. And I don't know, maybe I might use something else in terms of, I don't know, a biography. I don't know, perhaps of Abraham Lincoln or something or somebody like that. All would be really wonderful books. Uh, and so what, what I would be um, trying to say by taking these four books together, they tell us something about, about what? About the, 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 the presidencies of, of both Donald Trump as well as the presidencies of Joe Biden. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking too much about Donald Trump at this point and the world that he inherited um, in, in 2017. Um, but let's think instead about, about Joe Biden and the world that he inherited and sort of the opportunities 
um, and the context of which he is operating in. And when we think about Biden himself, and I mentioned to you in my opening comments, you know, Joe Biden brings a contrast of styles to the presidency that I perhaps has never been greater um, in American history. That again, I mentioned to you in my opening comments, Donald Trump came to office um, as the consummate outsider, even though almost every presidential candidate since Jimmy Carter has tried to run as an outsider. Uh, although I was going to say um, George H.W. Bush um, couldn't make that argument, really. I mean, he's like, in some ways, he was like Joe Biden, a consummate insider. But almost every president has tried to say in the last 50 years, they are the outsider coming in to change things. Trump came in, and I think both his attraction was the fact that he was an outsider. But at the end of the day, I'm going to argue that one of the, the failures of, of the Trump administration um, was, was the fact that he was an outsider. Now, for some, they will say it was what? The deep state that killed him. For others, it would be that what? Donald Trump never understood how to move the levers of government. Never understood, as, as Richard Neustadt said, you just can't order Congress around. You can't order other elected officials around. It's about the power to persuade. Additional, and so he sort of violated the number one rule of politics that was out there. Additionally, and we know this, and we can actually measure this out objectively, uh, the Trump administration never could figure out if it either wanted to move a conservative agenda or, in the words of, of Steve Bannon, to kill the deep administrative state. And so in many ways, the Trump administration was constantly at war internally about its philosophies and never sure how to use the reins of power uh, in order to be able to secure the objectives they wanted to be able to move. Where that pans out is after four years, if we look at, for example, the, the number of um, uh, executive orders that the Trump administration issued that were overturned. The Washington Post and other sources pointed out that when Donald Trump simply tried to sort of executive order his way through American politics, the courts stepped in because of legal violations. And at the end of the day, he had one of the worst track records in court of almost any president going as far back, at least probably 60, 70, 80 years. Had he been more successful, had he thought more about appointing people to office and keeping him in office, who knew how to move the levers of government, he could have probably accomplished way more than he did. So again, his strength and his weakness were his personality, his being an outsider, his being sort of like the CEO kind of mindset. All of this for some of his supporters, the attraction for his detractors, a problem. But at the end of the day, it clearly undermined his capacity to be able to, uh, um, to succeed on many scores. And as we do the transition into the Biden administration, why it's been relatively easy for the Biden administration to issue executive orders to undo very rapidly very much of what Donald Trump did. Additionally, Trump had that window, had that window in his first two years where he had majorities in the House and Senate, where he could have moved a lot more than he did. And after he got past the tax bill, for the most part, that was the singular major legislative accomplishment uh, that stands out for his administration. After that, his war with Congress, his war um, fight, fighting leadership of his own party, again, undermined his capacity to get more done than he possibly could have. In contrast, Biden, and I should also say one other thing, is that part of also what made Trump uh, both influential and also his downfall at the same time was his mastery of the social media, especially Twitter. Um, for his supporters, they loved it. For his detractors, they hated it. Uh, but there was no question he was able to define 
the day-to-day -day news agenda in the United States by sending out what the tweets at four in the morning of which then the, the American media had to respond to. In contrast, Joe Biden um, has taken a very, very different approach, um, has basically largely ignored the social media, um, doesn't have a Twitter account, or if he does, um, it's being managed by, by the official um, White House press, um, press secretary. Um, additionally, as I mentioned to you in my opening comments, at least 45 years of experience in Washington as a senator and a vice president. Um, he has also chosen to bring into office uh, a lot of careerists. Now, again, for some people, that's not good. But for people who are saying they want stability, they want continuity, they want people to know how to do things in Washington, he has brought in a lot of people, including people from the Obama era, um, who are now um, at the head, um, at the head of, of many critical agencies. And that's going to be very different because for good or for bad, and we've already seen this, having these um, experienced people in place is making it easier for them to maneuver um, um, the, the, the bureaucracy, to, to maneuver with executive orders, to be able to act um, in ways that he's going to be far more successful um, in using the levers of government than Donald Trump probably ever will be. Additionally, we have among things that, that Biden has an opportunity to do something with is why he does have the most narrow of narrow majorities um, um, in both the House um, and in the Senate. Um, he has moved some legislation, but he's going to be coming to sort of a political Rubicon very soon. Um, and the political Rubicon, that is a line to be crossed, a reference back to Caesar from a long time ago, um, is that um, he's probably not going to be able to move very much legislation um, at this point um, with the filibuster rule in place. And at some point, he's got to decide, does, can he get rid of the filibuster rule? Uh, will Joe Manchin from West Virginia go along? Because uh, it's not looking like he's going to be able to persuade very many Republicans. And so when we think about the context of the presidency, the narrow majorities, the filibuster rule, the the depth of the polarization um, that he faces today is even greater than what Donald Trump faced four years ago. Again, thinking about the context, we also should think about the fact that, that Joe Biden enjoys far higher approval ratings in office for the beginning of his presidency and to now than Donald Trump practically ever did. If that's an important factor in terms of the power to persuade, i.e. from Richard Neustadt, then I think that is critical. Um, I also think that the Biden administration is less ambivalent on the issue of, of the levers of power. That if the Trump administration was never sure um, the purposes of, of what they wanted to do with government, destroy it or use it to move the agenda, uh, Biden is much clearer in terms of what he wants to do. Um, and, and so I put all this together to say that when we start to assess at least the transition here, starting to think about contrasts, we have clear contrasts in style. We have um, a, a sense in which I think uh, uh, the Biden administration is more cognizant of the elements that influence power um, as Richard Neustadt describes them. Um, I think also we have a sense in which Joe Biden, this is the Skoronic argument, has took office with an opportunity, took within a historical context regarding, we'll get to it in a second here, about the pandemic and about the economy, took office with a certain amount of goodwill um, that, that I think um, is important for him to be able to act. All right, so a variety of different things here to think about here. Now, I wanna switch gears. If these four books are about understanding the powers of the presidency, and these books help us frame a way of thinking about, I think, Biden versus Trump, and we clearly, I could say a lot more, and I could do this in Q&A. Keep in mind also, if we actually look at the formal trappings of presidential power, that those formal trappings um, are broken into three sources of power. One, it's legislation. Two, it's executive orders. Three, it's political appointments. 
Uh, presidents have three ways of, of leaving an imprint, of creating what? Their transition formally. Um, one, it's through legislation. And as we know, Biden has been so far successful um, in moving you know, the new pandemic relief bill. Um, it was, um, he has a whole bunch of other things on his agenda he wants to be able to do at this point um, in terms of what? Um, infrastructure, tax reform, immigration, police reform, election reform, global warming. I mean, his list is an absolutely enormous. Um, most of that he needs legislation. It does not look like unless something dramatically changes, he's going to be able to get that. Um, he's talked about wanting to be bipartisan. He's talk, talked about trying to reach out, but the two sides, Republicans and Democrats, are far apart. It just doesn't look like um, there's much of a meeting of the minds there. So we're going to have to think about that as an issue. The second way presidents can achieve their transition, that is their imprint on the world, is through executive orders. Now, I did a piece recently, and I can't remember where it appeared now, um, where I wrote all about um, an analysis of executive orders and how we know, um, for example, in Trump's first four years in office, he issued far more executive orders in his first four years than the previous several presidents did in their first four years. And he was on a record pace to be able to, uh, in terms of issuing executive orders. Uh, remember, he took office criticizing Barack Obama for resorting to, the, to executive orders as a way to govern. Many people think executive orders are a sign of strength. I would argue that in fact, executive orders in part are also a sign of weakness, the inability to persuade, the inability to convince others to be able to go along with you. And one of the things that we have learned over time is that um, with the, the increased polarization of Congress, it has led to a decrease in the amount of legislation being passed and an increase in the amount of executive orders being issued. But executive orders only could move the dial a little bit. Presidents just can't act like kings and say, wow, I'm going to do whatever they want. Um, as Barack Obama found out when he tried to move on issues such as um, DACA for, immig you know, for immigrants um, or, um, or DAPA again for immigrants or on clean power, there are outer limits regarding how far the president can go. Biden is going to be able to go somewhat in terms of using executive orders. He's so far been successful in overturning many of the executive orders that Donald Trump issued because why? Many of those executive orders had either already been overturned in court or the executive orders that Trump issued didn't carry the force of law and therefore were easily reversible um, by another president. But again, at some point, he's going to face the outer limits of what to be able to do if he can't get Congress to go along with him. And then finally, presidents can use their appointment power. What's been fascinating is that Joe Biden has been uncharacteristic for a Democrat. Usually Democrats, oh, Biden was in that category, Clinton was in that category, are slow to fill administrative positions. Um, in fact, Biden has moved relatively quickly um, to do that, um, and especially even more quickly than Donald Trump did, who again, as I mentioned, was never sure what he wanted to do with government. But the other area where Biden has been uncharacteristic um, is that generally Democrats have been very slow to move on, on filling on judicial appointments. Reagan, when he took office back in 1981, was ready to go with a list of um, nominees for the federal courts. Um, and we saw the same thing with, um, with the second Bush, George Bush, and with Donald Trump. Democrats seem kind of lackadaisical. This time, however, Biden has moved very rapidly um, and is getting lots of judicial appointments confirmed. And so this is where he may have uh, a big legacy also. A few more things I want to bring up here um, in terms of some points I want to sort of lay out um, so we can think about it. So what 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 Biden has done has so far been very successful in getting a couple of small pieces of legislation passed, but at the same way, he got a major bill, Trump got a major bill. Now the question is, what can um, Biden do and will he be more successful in getting more than being a one-trick pony? He's more successful with the executive orders so far, 
more successful um, with filling appointments. As I mentioned to you, his agenda is really packed in terms of what he wants to accomplish domestically. I mentioned it before. Um, and then internationally, uh, his agenda has also packed um, wanting to address a whole bunch of issues regarding um, the Paris Accords, the world standing, our cooperation with, with our international allies, facing hot spots in terms of problems, um, in terms of, let us say, China in trade, um, or North Korea, um, Iran, and so forth. Um, all of these are issues both that he inherited from Donald Trump, who inherited them from Barack Obama, um, and, and gradually we're seeing that where Joe Biden is going, and this is where presidents have more freedom in international affairs, he's been moving the United States back towards um, a more traditional pattern of U.S. foreign policy that we've seen of recent. Donald Trump personalized foreign policy. It was about his personal relationships with foreign leaders. Um, Biden is more willing to rely upon um, uh, the foreign policy establishment, more willing to rely upon the careerists in terms of, um, in terms of foreign policy and civil service, uh, more willing to do multilateral agreements and work with allies and take less of a narrow America first agenda uh, than Trump did. But nonetheless, he's still taking a very hard line position regarding China taking, I'm going to argue, by the time the Trump administration ended, it was taking a very hard line towards North Korea and refusing to talk to them again. And I think Biden administration um, has adopted that as a perspective also. So in foreign policy areas, we're seeing some change, some continuity, again, in reference to my opening comment. Now, a couple last points here. A few weeks ago, it was the first 100 days of the Biden administration. And the media, of course, as is true with every first 100 days of a president, gets excited. And the reason why they do is a benchmark. When Franklin Roosevelt took office back in 1933, in his first 100 days, he had 76 bills signed into law perhaps more laws, um, that, well, not just perhaps, but we know it was, more laws in the first 100 days than any other president has signed into law in American history. His 100th day in office was June 11th, 1933. Back then, by the way, in 1933, presidents didn't take office until March. On July 24th, 1933, Roosevelt gave a radio address and when he talked about all that he had accomplished in his first hundred days. From then on, the media latched onto this hundred days as a benchmark. How do other presidents stack up? And the reality is probably no other president is ever going to be able to stack up to what Franklin Roosevelt did. The depth of the crisis, the depth of the problems of the depression, excuse me, were so great. His majority sufficiently large in Congress and public opinion so behind him um, that he had that once in a, I don't know, maybe a century opportunity to be able to do things. James McGregor Burns described him as one of the great transformational presidents. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm sorry. The New Deal um, really moved the U.S. in a very different direction, both um, domestically, and then eventually with our entrance into World War II, transformed the United States from really an inward looking country to what an international player um, of which we are today. In looking at Biden, one of the things that I didn't like is how the media for the first hundred days created a false narrative. It kept saying that Biden is acting like um, sounding like Roosevelt, wanting to propose this big, bold legislation, economic relief, infrastructure, global warming, et cetera, et cetera. And so it was comparing him, stacking him up to Roosevelt, and then criticizing him for not living up to that. Well, at no point did Biden ever say that that's what he was trying to do. Uh, Biden has never held himself out as a Roosevelt, has never held himself out as a transformational president. I remember in one of the debates he did with Bernie Sanders uh, back about a year ago, uh, might have been about what, a year ago last March, um, when Sanders said, 
Um, we're facing a crisis. We need a revolution. Biden said it's an emergency. We need to address the emergency. Biden is not by nature that transformational person. He's a transactional person. Whether he turns into a transformational one um, is yet to be seen, but I'm not sure he do. Uh, that's where his, his, um, his sort of, his instincts are. A few last points here, and then I'll open up for questions here, is that as we start to think about his first hundred days, again, he's been successful on appointments, successful on reversing many of the Trump initiatives in terms of executive orders. Um, he has had a few successes legislatively, but a lot more needs to be done at this point. He faces the, the difficulties of what? Of, of a partisan divide, um, uh, a divide over January 6th, the narrow majorities, the filibuster rule. He took office saying that his first goal was to do what? Was to get the pandemic under control and then to help the economy. He's largely done that. If Trump gets credit for Operation Warp Speed, for being able to get us to the development of a vaccine very rapidly, uh, uh, within less than what, less than a year, probably like eight months or something like that. What the Biden administration has been very successful in doing um, is getting those vaccines out, getting them distributed to states um, and getting us to the point where what? Uh, we've got what, 25 states now with over 50% of the adult population vaccinated. That's a pretty good accomplishment. But other things to think about, challenges that he faces i mentioned before it of course is what all that partisan divide it is the international issues um china russia north korea um, and then of course you know over the last couple of days belarus in terms of how um the the skyjacking of an airplane um is, is really creating a new major international incident that involves the united states and then this is the one year anniversary of george floyd the challenge of George Floyd's death, I should say, um, and the problems of racism, of policing, of getting the George Floyd um, um, uh, police reform legislation through um, through Congress has been very difficult also. So last things to think about. If Stevens Koronik is correct about presidents occupying a moment in history, the United States after World War II, its economy was approximately 50% of the world economy. Today, it's 15 to 18%. We live in a world very different than the world of 70 years ago, even a world of four years ago. We live in a world where the president faces enormous difficulties in terms of being able to transition the presidency, transition America in a direction that he wants to go. And what we need to be thinking about here is as we look at the next several months and then taking us into 2022 election, is that generally presidents have their most influence in these first two years Generally, the president's own party loses in Congress at the midterm elections, suggesting that the odds are right now, unless something changes, the Democrats may very well lose control of both the House and the Senate, or at least one of them. Um, how will that affect um, what the president wants to be able to accomplish moving forward? Okay, so I'm gonna stop there. Um, certainly, I could have talked a lot longer. Um, I do a lot more in terms of the presidency, but I think I've given you some flavor of a few things to think about. Okay, and now it is the turn of the audience. I see the questions coming in, but we do have time for more. So please uh, type your questions in. I will try to speak fast. I know we lost about 10 minutes. Uh, and uh, we wanna cover as much territory as possible. I also, I just wanna say before we begin though, for those of you who are interested in the four titles uh, mentioned by Professor Schultz, I put him in the chat line as he spoke them 
And then I went back and I added them again at the bottom of the chat line in a slightly more coherent fashion. If anybody has further questions about them, just get in touch with me. I, we probably have most of those books in the library. If we don't, we can get them. Okay, let's launch into the questions. Ah, the first one, all right. Regarding inheriting foreign policy, can you talk about whatever Jared Kushner was doing in Israel and what was the effect uh, on the current attacks on Palestine by Israel? And before we give uh, Professor Schultz a chance to answer this question, I wanna point out, we are going to have a speaker, Tom Hansen, on just this topic in uh, just a couple of weeks. So you can ask this question today and get one answer and maybe another answer or a you know, uh, an amplification of an answer in a couple of weeks. So save that question. But what uh, would you say, Professor Schultz? Well, first off, I would say I would defer to Tom Hansen, <laughs> who, who, will, who will have a much better answer, I hope, to me than I do. Um, this was always a perplexity for me. Uh, Jared Kushner had no experience in government, had no experience in diplomacy whatsoever. Uh, he went over supposedly to negotiate some kind of peace deal um, and, and, and promised that there would be a peace deal. Well, there wasn't. Uh, and and, and it, is, it is arguable on one hand, he had no impact. Some people are arguing to say that, well, the impact that he had was to assure Israel um, that we would be with them no matter what, um, and therefore um, emboldened Israel um, in terms of what's happened in the last few weeks. Um, at the same time, perhaps um, undermined um, um, the Palestinians uh, and, and therefore created sort of the, the, the mixture for, for the flare up that happened there. That's one possibility. Um, so one possibility is no impact whatsoever. Impact number two, um, perhaps not a positive one. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, I was always perplexed that that there was, if, if careerists were unable to broker deals and address the underlying problems, geopolitical issues of Palestine and Israel in the Middle East, um, I never thought that Jared Kushner was going to have success there. Okay. It's a testament to the power of uh, President Trump uh, on our imagination, if nothing else, that in your speech, the first two questions are both about uh, Trump, or the first three questions looking at it. If Trump is reelected in 2024, do you think he will govern differently? Would he be a better president in his second term? Uh, first, I'm skeptical that he will run uh, in 2024. Uh, Second, no, I don't think so. Uh, we, one of the other things, which is typical of what you see of presidents when they're in office, is presidents have a sense of learning curve and growth. And I don't mean that in the bad sense. For all of you who have ever worked, this is kind of a joke that I tell people, is that I say to people, uh, in my first job, I couldn't find the men's room for the first six months, let alone do my job. But you know what I'm getting at here is we're all learning our job um, and presidents transform over time um, and learn and grow. One of the things that we didn't see in the Trump administration is learning from their mistakes. And again, that point I mentioned about executive orders is that, uh, that right up to the end, um, he was being beaten repeatedly in court um, by issuing executive orders that were not valid, didn't follow the proper rules to be made. And so I would be skeptical uh, that if he were to be elected again, he would change his philosophy of governance. He would put in um, um, and trust the careerists um, uh, to govern and, and help him govern. Um, and instead, I think he would what, take the same approach as before. And so I, I don't see a shift in style. And if James David Barber is correct, and I think, again, still my favorite of all the books, um, that our style, our personal style for all of us, but in the case of presidents, is formed in our adolescence and it stays with us the rest mm -hmm. of our life. Yeah. Um, I guess the other way of saying it, I can summarize James David Barber's book in the old phrase, what? Can't teach an old dog new tricks. Um, so there's a certain amount of old dog new trick there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then a related question. How do you think historians will rate uh, Trump in terms of best or worst of presidents? 
Wow. Um, these are always tough questions. I mean, mm. think about, I'm going to pick two presidents in my lifetime and how they're being mm. reevaluated. Lyndon Johnson and Jimmy Carter. Mm. Uh, Lyndon Johnson leaves office, you know, in the midst of, of what? Uh, of, of Vietnam and so forth. 50 or 60 years later, people are looking back and saying, yeah, Vietnam wasn't good in terms of how he handled it, but his domestic agenda in terms of how much legislation he got passed, whether you like it or not, uh, was incredible. Uh, Jimmy Carter left office with historians rating him near the bottom, um, a horrible president. Now, I think most of us will concede and say Jimmy Carter might be the greatest post-president we've ever had in American history. Uh, I mean, whether you liked him as president or not, um, his work with Habitat and so forth has just been remarkable. But Jimmy Carter's um, has gone up steadily um, 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 in terms of in terms of historians. You know, it's 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 a hard call on this one. I mean, if if you had to do the immediate one right now in terms of saying. You know, for factors that influence presidents, how successful was their legislative agenda, um, how transformative they were. Again, G um, James McGregor Burns, um, were they sort of like healers uniting people? Uh, I think initially he's going to come near the bottom of the list, um, whether or not, you know, long after we're all dead, um, um, do future historians view him differently? Well, What's the old joke? You know, if you want to write history, become a historian. Um, so who knows how he's looked at 50 years later? Okay, sure. All right. Uh, in light of the Republicans' uh, internal warring factions at the moment, do you think Biden voters will come out in larger numbers uh, than expected uh, in the upcoming midterms in 2022? Wow. Uh... I'm not sure how to link those two together. I mean, clearly the Republicans are divided and they're at a war with themselves. Um, mm -hmm. How or how that does not impact uh, Democratic, or rather let's say, let's say a Democratic Party um, turnout or turnout favoring Democrats, I don't know at this point. I mean, we generally know that um, in the first midterm elections, when a president is in their first midterm, excuse me, the president's party generally loses about 14 members in Congress. Um, if that's the case, uh, what's potentially going to happen is that uh, um, Biden loses control of the House of Representatives and pass, possibly loses control of the U.S. Senate. On the other hand, in 2024, there are far more Republicans up for office than there are Democrats. Um, and so it's it's going to be a it's going to be a close one here um, in terms of what could happen and and how all this inter motivates voters to show up to vote um, who who came out last year just not clear at this point my crystal ball is just not good enough to go that far ahead <laughs> okay the next questioner wants to know about the relationship between the Biden administration and the Obama legacy is this the reason Biden is trying to move quickly? Um, how did how is he uh, mindful of the Obama legacy? Well, I think there are certainly, in some ways, um, Biden is 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 trying to continue some of the of the legacy from Obama era. It clearly with the Affordable Care Act, clearly with some of the I would say. Um, initiatives in foreign policy. But at the same time, if you listen to Biden's rhetoric, I think he's acutely conscious, again, going back to, let's say, to Stephen Skoranek's book, acutely conscious of the fact that the world has changed, you know, that, that the political coalition that elected him looks very, not very different, but looks different um, than the coalitions that elected Obama. Um, the world looks different. And, and thus, his responses are different. I mean, just right off the bat, there was not a pandemic in 2008, there wasn't a pandemic in 2016, when, 17 when he left office. And so what I'm finding interesting is Biden both trying to uh, continue a legacy of, of, uh, of Obama, trapped by the legacy of Trump, 
and trying to change both of them um, in terms of, again, if I can use the word transition to the world, his worldview and the world we have now. In my notes, by the way, I never quoted it here. Okay, uh, what was my closing conclusion originally I was gonna have for my talk here today is one of my favorite works of literature. You can't go home again. Hmm. Uh, and in some sense, uh, uh, Biden can't go home again in terms of just going back to the but go back to the, the Obama era. Home is different now, whatever it is. Okay. Um, in your opinion, did the Trump administration do anything to sabotage the transition to Biden? Certainly didn't make the transition easy. The fact that there was not an acknowledgement that Biden had won uh, until very, actually maybe begrudgingly, perhaps never, depending on what media accounts. Um, there were media accounts that were suggesting they weren't sharing intelligent briefings and so forth. And some people would argue that January 6th were all efforts at sabotaging um, the Biden presidency. Um, and, that's, and that's perhaps the case. But this is actually a really great opportunity for me to talk about something else um, along the lines here, is that one of the things and I did a piece in The Hill. People don't know what The Hill is. The Hill is published in Washington. Uh, it's somewhat kind of the gossipy insider um, mm -hmm. um, newsletter, whatever, newspaper in Washington. Um, occasionally, um, I, I do a piece for them. And one of the things that I talked about was how we may be needing to rethink um, presidential transitions in a different way. Um, being president is an on and off switch. Either you are president or you're not president. And in many other countries of the world, when we, they go through head of state transitions, um, there are literally transitions. For example, in Canada, when they're doing a transition of power, the existing government is at best only allowed to do what? A, a, um, almost like a watchman status or almost what? Just keep the lights on. They're not, the powers don't let them do very much. And the incoming prime minister actually has some authority to be able to do some things. Um, I think we need to be rethinking how much power we let um, existing presidents have um, as they're exiting out and, and what powers new presidents should have as they're, after they've been elected. And when I make my next comment, it's not just about Trump, it's about every, almost every president in my lifetime. After the election, presidents who are outgoing do what? They pardon lots of people and they issue lots of executive orders and ways of trying to cement their legacy. And perhaps maybe we ought to be thinking about, sh um, should we let presidents be able to issue executive orders um, after they've lost? lost? Um, should they be able to uh, pardon people? Uh, now, I know there's constitutional limits on what we could do here, but again, I just throw this out because I think there's a fascinating set of questions here to think about in terms of, of, of should we be giving incoming presidents more authority um, to, um, as they transition in? Okay. Um, you talked about the uh, first hundred days of the Roosevelt administration and the astonishing amount of uh, legislative work that was accomplished. This questioner wants to know, didn't, uh, LBJ, Lyndon Johnson, have the most laws passed as president regarding racial and, um, and poverty issues. You're absolutely correct. This is why I was mentioning that Lyndon Johnson's um, star, I guess, um, <laughs> I'm, almost, I'm almost quoting now, uh, Lone Star Rising, which is, um, I can't remember which, which biographer it was. Um, I think that was one of the titles of his book, Robert Carroll, because Robert, yeah, yeah um, Carroll's biographies um, of, um, of LBJ are just absolutely brilliant. But you're absolutely correct that, that if we look at uh, the scope of legislation in terms of the great society addressing race and racism in America, um, it's absolutely phenomenal. Uh, the 64 Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, the Fair Housing Act. Uh, I mean, his legacy on these issues are just absolutely um, incredible in the sense of which 
the laws that he got through in Congress um, really did transform American society um, on, on many scores here. So, so I think he gets enormous credit for that. That's been, again, largely overlooked by his handling of the Vietnam War. Um, and, um, and, and again, that's why I'm saying presidents are reappraising him. I should also point out that if you look at, um, let's say, the, roughly the first two years in office, and if we were to go back in time um, and say, okay, from Roosevelt to Truman to Eisenhower, et cetera, et cetera, and we obviously can't do this with Biden yet, but if we were to look at for all the presidents from Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt to the present and look at the percentage of legislation passed in their first two years, like how successful they were, the most successful president in his first two years was Lyndon Johnson. Um, I think it was something like, it, it, so, don't quote me on the exact number, I'm gonna forget it a little bit here, but I think he got through what, 83% of the legislation that he proposed. Uh, I mean, that's pretty remarkable. Uh, uh, that's just, just really phenomenal. So yeah, so Johnson's record on these issues is actually quite good. And I would like to say, if anyone wants to follow up on the biography, the multi-volume biography of Lyndon Johnson uh, by Robert Caro, I've put Robert Caro's name in the chat line. The library does own all, I believe it's three or four volumes of that biography. Uh, we do own all those volumes. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you, Judith, there's also a shorter, for people who don't want to read that much, uh, uh, you double check the spelling for me. I think it's Robert Dalek, D-A-L-L-A-K. I think that's correct. Robert Dalek. Uh, it could be D-A-L-L-I-K, but I can't remember now. Um, um, also has a very, very good biography of Lyndon Johnson, if anybody wants to read it. And I you know you're probably looking for it now to try to find, is, is it D-A-L-L-E-K? Okay, okay. I'm okay. not sure. I, you know, he's actually from my alma mater, Berkeley. So okay, I, okay. I know his name. I'll check in a minute, but let me go on with another question and I will confirm. Um, this question asks about the uh, January 6th riot I, you may have answered this, but perhaps you want to expand on it. How did it affect the transition between Trump and Biden? Well, how, well, clearly, well, a variety of things. One is that it forced Biden into something that he didn't want to have to deal with initially, which is the aftershot of, 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 of January 6th. Um, I think if he had been left to his own devices, I think Biden did not want to go through the impeachment and trial. Um, I think he just wanted to kind of not quite say, move out Donald Trump, let me move in and take over, et cetera, et cetera. So I think the fact that that Congress had to was was obsessed with with um, the impeachment, with the trial, um, um, and even right now where it is fighting over, is it gonna authorize a January 6th commission? I think has helped deplete some of the political capital uh, that, that, that uh, was, that's necessary for Joe Biden um, to do what he wants to do. And, and I do think it also just polarized America even more. If we couldn't have been, if we weren't divided before, January 9th divided us even more. And that's surprising because in the initial few days after it, I thought America came together and said, this was really horrible what happened. You know, I mean, somebody might correct me on this one here, for those of you who are sort of amateur historians, but I think last time um, the Capitol might have been ransacked, might have been the War of 1812. Um, now, I know the White House was burned in, in the War of 1812, but I can't remember, if anybody can sort of tell Judy and she can tell the rest of us here, did when the British came in the War of 1812, did they also ransack the Capitol? Uh, I can't remember now, um, but if, if they did, that's the last time it happened. Okay, I will look that up for everyone. Um, I've read this questioner says that Biden has a short fuse in private, that he is very impatient when he doesn't get answers right away. Will he have a hard time keeping good staff? Also, there is talk that he may have cognitive issues. Well, <laughs> please comment. <laughs> um, I don't know, you know, I don't know. I, you know, okay, funny story about when George Bush, the second George Bush was president, there was one day I was talking to one of my students and, one of, and something came up, I don't know what it was. And one of my students said, I hate George Bush. He's a terrible person. And I turned to the student and I said, oh, do you know George Bush personally? 
have you met him? And they say, no. And I said, well, how do you know he's a terrible person? And the reason why I say that, I don't know Joe Biden um, personally. Um, I don't know what he's like privately. Uh, I don't know how much of this is true, how much this is a rumor. I know people have been sort of cl claiming he's got short fuse. Some people say not a short fuse. Some people are saying that what? Um, that he's got cognitive issues. Well, we all have cognitive issues, I guess, <laughs> at some point. Um, so I don't know. I don't know how to answer that question. I saw an article, was it the Washington Post or the New York Times in the last day or so, um, that said that what? Part of what Joe Biden spends his day doing um, is a lot of reading. Um, he works, tries to work out every day. I don't, I don't know. I really don't know um, about sort of the, have any real personal insights into Joe Biden as a person. Okay. Well, from a quick reading of uh, uh, Wikipedia, it does appear that the War of 1812 was the last time uh, the Capitol was sacked. Um, and okay. the Capitol was attacked, I should say. Um, okay, uh, can you comment on the challenges that big tech poses and how have the two presidents differed in their approach to that issue? <coughs> Boy, big tech. Hmm. First off, I would recommend everybody, Amy Klobuchar, our Senator, has a new book out um, on antitrust law and competition policy. Uh, which the library should get. It just literally came out last month or so. Hold on a second. I could even show, uh -huh. since I just finished reading it a few days ago. Uh, okay, La -da. there it is. Okay, so that's the book. Uh, Amy Klobuchar is the one. And she has a great discussion in there uh, on, on sort of big tech. And what she's sort of arguing right off the bat is that we all might find it fun to go on Facebook, Twitter, and Google, uh, but she points out, as others have, the threat that these three monopolistic entities pose in terms of information um, and, and a lot of other ways in terms of um, how we organize our society. Amazon is the same thing. We all might have been thrilled about Amazon during the pandemic, but it's helped kill a lot of small businesses. Okay, the reason why I mention all of this is that we've all benefited from big tech. Uh, at the same time, we're all being hurt by them. Uh, I think it's too soon to tell in terms of where the Trump, or rather the, uh, the Biden administration is going to be in terms of big tech. Are they going to move uh, more aggressively on any trust activities? Um, how are they going to deal with privacy issues and so forth? Um, the Trump administration um, had a love-hate relationship with them. There's no question about it. Um, Trump benefited from the social media, was the master of it, of Twitter, but at the same time, Hate, hated on um, the social media, uh, especially Facebook and that for the ways he thought that they were censoring him. It's just too, it's just not clear at this point uh, where the Biden administration is going uh, uh, on, let's say, competition policy um, or broader um, how they think about um, big tech. But I will say, as much as we may all hate big tech on one level, they are an enormous driver of the US economy at this point. Um, and we can't um, simply um, say we don't care what happens to them. Okay, I, I, at this point, I am gonna insert a question that I myself have been wondering about since extremely late on the night of January 5th. When you spoke to this group in mid-December, you forecast that uh, Republicans would win both of the Georgia Senate seats. As we found out on January 5th, you were wrong and uh, Georgia flipped the Senate. What happened? What, 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 what surprised you? What, why were you wrong? Okay. As an astute <laughs> fellow like yourself, why were you wrong? <laughs> well, 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 first off, I would say, uh, I'll use a line that my father said, is that <laughs> uh, if you could be that predictive uh, or that accurate, if you could be completely as accurate uh, on everything, you should be playing the ponies and not you know, uh, <laughs> getting in politics. Okay, so so yeah, I, I, I occasionally get them wrong. Now, I'm doing my new edition of my Presidential Swing States book. I have a person um, who's an expert on Georgia and I had spoken to her and I said to her, are they going to flip Georgia? And she said, no, I don't think so either. So, so mm -hmm. even the expert um, on Georgia, you know, and I don't consider myself an expert on Georgia politics. Um, so, um, so what happened there? Um, I, th I think a few different things happened here. You know, one of them uh, is that 
I think Georgia was the, you know, I hate to use the phrase perfect storm. It was the combination of, of the pandemic, um, the Trump alienating college educated um, whites who didn't like the way he was handling the pandemic, didn't like the way um, he was talking about race. Um, I think there was um, a high percentage of, of, of people of color in, in Georgia compared to other Southern states. And the population that was urban, uh, which was voting Democrat, uh, was, was very high. And I've got to give Stacey Abrams credit for an incredible political mobilization. Um, having said all of that, I mean, remember, the results were still narrow, uh, very, very mm -hmm. narrow in that state at the, both the presidential and at the Senate level. And so on one level, we were within, you know, I got it wrong, um, but we were within margins of error. You know, the sense is that what? Move 5,000 or whatever the numbers were, move 10,000 people one way mm -hmm. or another, uh, we would have very different results. I mean, at one point I mused and thought, well, maybe the Democrats win one of the seats, but not both of them. But I said, nah, we're so partisanly voting, it's gonna be all or nothing. And I went with nothing and I got it wrong. <laughs> all right. Um, Okay, well, I'm going to say now we have just about 10 minutes left, and I apologize to everyone whose question I'm not going to get to. These are all great questions. I'm going to try and speak quickly and steam forward so we can get to as many as possible. Um, how concerned are you about Biden's age in terms and Trump's age in terms of uh, power succession? Well, that's, I guess this I guess that's why we have vice presidents, you know. Uh, we have vice presidents in case um, presidents die in office, of which we've unfortunately had, you know, that happened many times. Um, so on one level, um, I mean, the, 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 the machinery to pick up is there um, if he were to become incapacitated. Uh, I mean, many people worried about this, what, years ago when Ronald Reagan at the time was the oldest presidential uh, candidate ever. So on one level, I'm not worried about it in the sense that um, you know, if American politics comes down to only one person, then we've got a real problem that's out there. And, but the fact that, that we've got presidential lines of succession, uh, we do have an administrative state um, 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 to help govern, those are the fail safes that are in place. And a related question, uh, what is the likelihood that Kamala Harris is getting the experience she needs uh, in order to succeed Biden? I had to wince when he put her in charge of borders and immigration. Seems like she will be burdened by a difficult, even an impossible no-win task. I mean, many of us think, and it may or may not be the case, you know, that Biden's a one-term president, although He's not talking as if he's a one-term president, but many of us are, are thinking that she's, she's likely the future of the Democratic Party as the next nominee beyond Biden. Mm -hmm. uh, I, mean, I, I mean, one of the easiest predictions that I made about two years ago is when I said that Kamala Harris is going to be the vice presidential candidate. Uh, that was like that was like the absolute easiest prediction in the world to make. Uh, and I still think that that barring something um, unforeseen. If Biden doesn't run in 2024, or if he does and he wins again, or, or whatever happens like that, uh, the next presidential candidate for the Democrats after Biden will be um, Vice President Harris. And I want to take note that I believe you did make that prediction to this group. So, you know. <laughs> you know, at least I got one right. So. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> okay. Um, regarding presidential behavior, how does having celebrity candidates, as we are seeing now, how does that alter our ideas about presidential behavior, since okay. it seems that the rules for governing are in transition? Yeah. So, okay. uh, bench, previous benchmarks used to select candidates may not be applicable to today. All right. How would you respond to that? First, I want to type into the life into the chat message here a word here. Okay. Is this a word you cannot say? No, I want to make sure you got spelled right. Polytainment. Okay, do you see I'm it? A, 
No, I'm afraid you didn't type it into everybody. I don't. Okay, see so it. let me get let me get this to everybody. Hold on a second. I want every I want everybody all panels and attendees. Okay, good. All right, so here's the word I'm going to type in. You're going to see where I'm going. There, we, I think I actually spelled it right this time. Okay, okay perfect. Okay, okay. When Jesse Ventura first got elected back in in 1998, I can't claim the term as my own. One of my graduate students uh, and I wrote a piece together and her argument was that Jesse Ventura was part of a long line of what she called polytainers and polytainment. And mm -hmm. it was a combination of the word politics and entertainer. So mm -hmm. polytainment is politics and entertainment together, polytainer, politician, um, entertainment together. And she said that we've had a long history of having um, polytainers get elected. Um, and, and having the merger of politics and entertainment. And, and, and what, what has become the case is that oftentimes politicians um, use entertainment venues as a way of reaching out to people. They, they sort of, they, they become what rock stars, like in the way that what Barack Obama was. And I gotta mm. do a Obama, I gotta do an Obama Clinton story in a second here. Um, but in some cases we've had what? People go from being um, entertainers to politicians. Remember Fred Grandy, who played Gopher um, on the Love Boat? He gets elected to be uh, what, what, uh, a member, a representative in Iowa. Uh, uh, Sonny of Sonny and Cher goes on to get elected to Congress. Um, uh, sometimes they succeed, but more often than not, um, they don't have the skills because what? Government, like anything else, requires skills. At the end of the day, government and business, government and entertainment are, are very, very different. Um, remember that old line from a billion years ago, for those of us who are old, the person who said, I'm not a doctor, but I play one on television. I mean, here, it's what you have to more than just play a politician on television. Um, despite what anybody thinks, um, what's his name from West Wing, uh, uh, Martin Sheen, probably yeah. would not be a very good president as much as you <laughs> folks, uh, many of you folks would be enamored by him. So, <laughs> yeah. it's, so it's a fast, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a trend that gets you name recognition, but doesn't guarantee you have the skills to govern. My quick Obama-Clinton story. Uh, back in 08, Obama and Clinton both came to the Twin Cities. Obama, and I got press credentials to see both of them. Obama was at the Target Center and it was a rock concert. I mean, it was just amazing to go there. And people were excited. A week later, well, that, no, eventually she became Secretary Clinton, but at that time she was, um, she was um, Senator Clinton. She came to Augsburg College and I describe it as her giving an incredibly competent university lecture. Yeah. And I mentioned that because she was competent, she was smart, but there was no electricity. Yeah. And somewhere, even, even people who are competent need to have that little bit of electricity to get people excited. Yeah. Okay, we're going to try and cram in two more questions here because we got such interesting ones. Please talk about the ballot review in Maricopa County in Arizona. Well, it's, it's, there is a narrative from Trump that many Republicans have adopted right now, that it's a stolen election, that Trump didn't win legitimately. And I think in part, the recounting in Maricopa County um, um, is trying to appease that faction of the party. This is the faction that's at war with what? Um, with Representative Cheney you know, in Wyoming. And so what we're gonna find, it's gonna be really interesting at the end of the day, the counting in Maricopa County is sloppy, it's awful, et cetera, et cetera. But so far, guess what? It's not changing any results. Um, I mean, what we've learned since election day, what was it like 63 lawsuits that Trump and Trump forces brought? They lost, I think, all but one. One was out of small procedural victory. They're doing the recounts. Um, they've lost all of them. Uh, at the end of the day, it may not persuade some of the hardcore people, but at the end of the day, it's showing that what? We essentially ran what? A free election with fair counts. And we ought to be happy about the fact that what? That the elections were essentially um, uh, free from fraud. Okay, and final question. Will the current split in the Republican party lead to a new third party? Possibly, 
but it, it, the question becomes who splits from whom and where do they go? Um, the prospects of a split party don't bode well um, for a major party. Remember when Teddy Roosevelt split in 1912, um, it cost the Republicans the ticket because he ran as the bull moose third party candidate. So does the dominant Republican party be the one that's indebted to Trump or is it or does or do they break away and go somewhere else? So that's part of the issue here. But the longer issue to be thinking about here is the fact that uh, in the next 10 years, both the Republican Party and the Democratic parties face existential problems as the baby boomers and silent generation, the main members of both parties, I'll say gracefully exit the political system. Um, and it is not clear that either of the two parties are speaking well to a new generation of people coming up. Okay, I'm afraid that's all the time we have. Uh, thank you so much, Professor David Schultz. Thank you to our wonderful audience. Uh, I wish we could bring Professor Schultz back to answer all the questions that we didn't get to in this session. Perhaps we will in the future. Um, thank you very much to uh, the behind the scenes crew. Please, everyone, come back next week when we will have Star Tribune columnist Laurie Sturdivant who will talk on the topic turnout, Minnesota's turnout, and Joan Groh's legacy. But for today, I'm going to say thank you, everyone, and goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.